Chris Godinas, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday at noon on YouTube, and then I post it up to the same name on Facebook. This video is for educational and informational purposes only. If you feel you need a therapist, please go to Google, type in therapy, your city, psychology today will pop up, click on that, and it will have qualified therapists in your area. Also, the views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other damn therapist for that matter. Boom, shakalaka done. Okay, I'm going to try to get to some of the questions that I did not get to two weeks ago and this week. So some of them will be on triggers, others will be on communal and uh, covert. So, okay, question. How do I control the triggers that I'm dealing with regarding the current events that are going on in the world right now? Well, it is overwhelming. It is. You know, we've got a pandemic, we've got political stuff going on, we've got social unrest, we've got, you know, you name it. <laughs> Death hornets, whatever they're called, you know, murder hornets, you know, it's like, okay, just stop, you know? So it is overwhelming. So just you validate that first and foremost. It's like, is this completely batshit crazy? Yeah, 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 it is. So then you do the Buddhist worry chart. Is there a problem? Hell yeah, there's a problem. Can you do anything about it? Well, limited, you know, you do what you can, and then the rest, you just kind of got to go, okay, I can't worry about it because I can't do everything. I can wear a mask. I can wash my hands. I can practice social distancing. I can write letters to my representatives. I can, you know, there's stuff we can do, but there's a lot we can't do. So you just do what you can, validate that that's what's going on. That's what you're feeling. You're feeling overwhelmed and that's okay because everybody is. And you just do what you can, let go of the rest. Write, burn, journal, do whatever you need to. Get it out of your head, get it on the paper, trot it out to the barbecue, read it out loud once, burn it. If you need to get mad at God, get mad at God. Seriously, it's like whatever you're thinking and feeling, validate, write it, burn it, let it go. You know? So, okay, yes, that is how you deal with it. And reach out to trusted family members and friends because now is the time to ask for help. It absolutely is. And Remember, when we come from an abusive household, you know, mom, dad, whoever was abusive, or even a romantic relationship that was abusive, the number one rule is don't tell anyone, don't share with anyone, don't ask for help. It's all silence. Why? Because abuse thrives in silence. So if you're needing to vent, if you need to reach out, reach out to trusted family members, reach out to trusted friends. I do believe that every state has got some form of a warm line. A warm line is uh, manned by peer support. They're not, they're not counselors, they're not psychiatrists, they're not psychologists, whatever, but it's peer support and it's somebody you can talk to. So, you know, do that. If you can't get with a trusted family or a trusted friend, there are warm lines that you can do. So just look up national warm line or look up your state's warm line, and there should be a warm line, W-A-R-M, warm. So it should be there somewhere. Okay. Um, how will I recover to the point that people don't always nearly trigger me? So much of the time I'm triggered by people and it makes me want to isolate away from people. So to get to that point, you have to practice detachment. So when we come out of an abusive family, an abusive relationship, etc. We've been trained to think everything is our fault. Literally. Like we've been, you know, we're on high alert, we're like hyper vigilant, or we've checked out. That was the other, you know, somebody asked me that question. They're like, well, you know, you were talking about hyper vigilance, but what about if they just check out? Yeah, you could absolutely. That's another that's another sign of PTSD is when you just whoop, check out dissociate, not there, not present, not dealing. That's, that's also not healthy. So, um, what you can do is you work on you. It's, it's not your fault. You work on detaching. It's not the way other people behave speaks volumes about them, very little about you. And that's important because we've been trained to think that everything is a result of us. It's a very, uh, Egocentric, but not in a narcissistic way. It's kind of like, it's it's my fault. Mia culpa, mia culpa, mia maxima culpa. It's my fault, my fault, all my fault. And that's because our abusers have trained us to think that that is true. It is not true. So you have to start practicing detachment. It's like how this person is behaving is on them. They are responsible for their behavior. They are responsible for their bullshit. If they trigger us, you want to ask yourself, hmm, how do they remind me of my abuser? 
And that's, that's very true. That's very common. So don't beat yourself up. It's going to happen. It is. And the way to work on that is to practice detaching and recognizing your triggers and relating them back to where they belong and not taking things personally and being able to go, mm, this person just acted just exactly like fill in the blank right? Mom, dad, lover, whatever, boss, whatever. And being able to go, mm, okay, that's a trigger. I need to take a deep breath. I'm safe. I'm okay. Everything's fine. So it's about self-soothing and working with your inner child. So again, inner child workbook, Catherine Taylor, CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving, Pete Walker, self-esteem workbook, Glenn Schiraldi, Disease to Please, Harriet Breaker. These are all wonderful books to help work on that. And really it's working on you. It's working on you and detaching. Detaching, 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 detaching. Do I get triggered out in public? Not very often. You know, every once in a while, yeah. Like, I think I told you about that woman that screamed at me for wearing a mask in Winco. So that was a little tense, but then I kind of took a deep breath and I went, okay, first of all, she's a total stranger. This speaks volumes about the lack of manners she was raised with. And nothing about me. I'm choosing to protect myself. I'm choosing to protect others. And if she doesn't want to, fine. That's on you, babes. But don't you dare start screaming at me, a total stranger that you don't know, who hasn't said two words to you because you've got some sort of political agenda with you're not wearing a mask or wearing a mask. I wear a mask when I go out in public. So, but that's because I study science journals. So, um, anyway, the point being is, is that spoke volumes about her. Now I could have taken it very personally and been like, Oh my God, you know, and freaked out. But then it was kind of like, you don't know me from Adam's lady. I, I wouldn't speak to my worst enemy the way you just spoke to me. Wow. Sucks to be you hate to be your kid. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, there it is. And then you just got to let it go. Let it the fuck go. Seriously. It's like, can you change it? Nope. Can you educate them? Probably not. <laughs> you know? So you just wish them well and you let them go. So there that is. You will get there. It will take time. It takes practice. I'm not kidding you. This stuff is not magic bullets. It's like I have people come to me going, well, but I want it now. I want it now. I want it now. And I'm like, wouldn't that be lovely? It doesn't work that way. It takes practice. You have to practice. You have to practice being around people. You have to practice getting triggered, like seriously. And then you have to be able to identify your triggers and then go, okay, I can soothe myself and recognize this has nada to do with me. So practice, practice, practice. Okay, I have felt that I am triggered in a, into a pre-verbal stage. Not uncommon, not uncommon. So when we go through abuse, okay, it depends on how old we were when the abuse first started happening. So if we get triggered into a pre-verbal stage, it makes perfect sense that you're not able to put words to it. That's why the inner child workbook with all of those exercises about pre-verbal is so important. So in one of the exercises, she has you hold yourself as a baby and see what comes up. Another exercise, you know, she has you grab some applesauce, throw out a blanket and smear it all over your head. See what comes up. And some people, nothing happens because they weren't abused during those stages of development. Some people, they do that. They end up calling me saying, hi, uh, I'm freaking out. I did this exercise and I'm feeling and I don't even know what I'm feeling. So it's going to happen. So um, what you want to do is you want to get with a really good trauma therapist, really good trauma therapist that understands pre-verbal abuse that can help you process and help you be able to express. Now the inner child workbook is really good with that. It is going to trigger the living fuck out of you just to be aware. So um, that's how you start dealing with that. Get with a really good trauma therapist. Read the inner child workbook. Start working on self-esteem. Start working on safety. Making yourself safe as you are expressing and processing the abuse. So yeah, some of the abuse is pre-verbal. Some of it we're just not able to cognitively express in the moment because that inner child is probably infant or toddler. So yeah, so get with a good trauma therapist, start working on the uh, inner child workbook with Kat by Katherine Taylor. Um, yeah, that's, 
So that's how you start working on it. I, I cannot stress the importance of getting with a good trauma therapist. You may want to consider something like EMDR, EFT, you know, those types of therapies. So look into it, find one. Okay, uh, can you have triggers of abandonment from childhood? Yes. Oh, oh yes. Oh, definitely. I get attached easily, so that's an attachment issue. So remember, how we attach to our caregiver really in, impacts how we attach romantically. So there's different forms of attachment. So a normal attachment, it's secure. It's a secure attachment. Mom and dad are going to be there. You're taken care of. You're loved. You're not being abused. Everything's good. You know you're safe. Okay, that's a secure attachment. An insecure attachment is where mom and dad are flakes. You, you don't know if you're going to be taken care of. Sometimes they're there. Sometimes they're not. Maybe there's abuse going on, you know. And then there's avoidant attachment where it's like, no, 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 no. I already know what's going to happen. If I attach to somebody, I'm going to get hurt. There's, you know, yeah, it's all attachment stuff. And yes, that does happen during infancy and it does impact how we attach then either healthfully or unhealthfully as we grow up and become, you know, romantically involved. So, um, so terrified of abandonment goes back to probably some form of abandonment that happened when you were an infant or a, a very small child. So um, I would start working on the inner child workbook. Again, we've got to go back and figure out who, what, when, where, how, why, you know. Um, and I would start working with a trauma therapist and work on the abandonment issues. Abso freaking lutely hugely important. PTSD from Surviving to Thriving, CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker would be another good book. Um, Attaching easily and then people ghosting me is extremely triggering. Well, a ghosting is abandonment and it's also fucking rude. I would just like to say that for the record, your honor. Thank you. Yeah. Sometimes I just, I'm, I'm going to start sounding like my great grandma. It's like kids these days. What the hell? You know, it's like, I'm sorry. You don't ghost. That's rude. Number one. Number two, it's coward move. Total dick move. Total, total coward coward move. So, you know, if you're going to not be with somebody, you let them know, I'm sorry, this is not working out. I, I really, you know, good luck, you know, it's me, not you, whatever, you know, and then let them go. But you don't just not show up, like literally not showing up. And that's, that's a coward move. That's a total coward move. And the excuse I hear is, oh, well, but, uh, or, uh, or it's uncomfortable and I didn't want to blah, blah, blah. Okay. You're a coward. Speak the truth. Tell them the truth. It is better to hurt. It is better to hurt somebody with the truth than to hurt somebody by ghosting, which is another form of lying by omission. Oh yeah, bitches! I just said that. Mm -hmm. So it's rude. It's fucking rude, and it's something that abusers do. It's a form of abuse, and it's poor manners. So yeah, don't ghost. Do me a favor. Don't ghost. Be a real person, male or female, I don't care, whatever your gender is, doesn't matter, don't ghost. It's stupid, don't ghost. It's rude, it's abandonment, and it's abuse, and it's a coward move, don't do it. So yeah, you're going to get triggered by that because it's abandonment. It's a form of abuse. So um, work on the original wound. What is the original wound? Who abandoned you? That's what you want to work on. And I would strongly suggest not dating until you get this fixed. Because if you don't, your picker is going to remain broken and you're going to keep picking people that remind you of the original wound. Our inner child will be in control, not the adult you, when you don't want that. Trust me, you don't want three-year-old you picking who you're dating. But three-year-old you will pick who you are dating if you don't work on the original issue, the original abandonment. So what ends up happening is the inner child looks outside and goes subconsciously. This is not conscious. Not like you wake up in the morning and go, hey, I'd like to date the parent I had the hardest time with. No, no, no. This is all unconscious. So you look, it looks over here and goes, oh, well, hey, that person reminds me of mom or dad. I know if I can make them love me, I prove these people wrong. Half of a shit sandwich, half of a shit sandwich, <clears throat> total shit sandwich. You don't want that. So I would suggest staying single and work on the original wound. Work on the original abandonment. That is what you're going to need to do. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Okay. Um, 
Chris, can you do a video on how to have a good, healthy relationship with money after narcissistic abuse? Yeah, I think I can. So this week, the video is going to be on confrontation, how to confront people, how to say no, how to stand up for yourself. Assertiveness, we're gonna work on that because we need to. Um, and then I think the week after that, let's talk about our relationship to money and boy howdy do our abusers really give us a skewed idea of money so let's talk about a healthy relationship so that'll be not this weekend but the following weekend so okay let me just start this so i can remember not to forget it um okay question is it possible for a narcissist to seem sensitive at first oh absolutely oh Oh my God, they will give an Academy Award winning performance. Trust me on that one. Sensitive, crying, you know, tears up, all of this. But then over time, um, get offended towards any critique towards them. And then they just don't care. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they, they, that's the love bombing. They're, they're mirroring you. They mirror you. So if you're a super sensitive person and you cry at movies guilty as charged, um, they'll try to mirror you. They'll try to be as sensitive as you are in the beginning. But then as soon as they know they've got you, they, the, the mask comes off, the devalue discard, and they're just callous and cold and calculating. So yeah. Um, how do you learn to feel? I never learned how to do that. And my mind is a blank. Get with a good therapist. Seriously, I'm not kidding you. Get with a good therapist. Pull up a feelings chart. So when I worked in the homeless shelter, a lot of the guys there, drug addicts recovering, you know, alcoholics recovering, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, horrifically abusive home lives, you know, children growing up, and they didn't know how to feel. They couldn't recognize an emotion if it walked up and did the Watusi with them. So what we did is we had them get feel charts, feeling charts. You know, you can go online, you can, you know, click on feelings, feelings chart, and it'll pop up and it will so start listing out the feelings. And then you start identifying, what are you feeling during the day? Can you put a name to that, you know? Super important. The other thing to do too is check in with yourself throughout the day. What am I feeling? If I put an emotion to this, what would it be? So start learning to identify your emotions. It's really important. It's really important, um, you know? When you get up and look at the sunrise, what are you feeling when you see that sunrise or that beautiful sunset? What are you feeling? What are the emotions that come up for you? That's one way to start doing it. You start putting it towards everyday things. It's like, well, what is that that I'm feeling? Am I happy? Am I sad? Am I, am I nostalgic? Am I, you know, longing? Am I, what am I feeling? What's the emotion? So you start working with that. So pull up a feeling chart and start putting emotions to your everyday tasks. It's like, what are you feeling? What are you feeling when you, I don't know, do the dishes? Are you annoyed? Are you happy? Are you, you know, what, what is it? You know, what are you feeling? What's the emotion? Get with a good therapist. Start working on that. Have that therapist help you. This is a Herculean task. Not impossible, but it's really important to start recognizing what your emotions are. Okay, uh, I feel like almost every other guy I see is a narc. I don't trust absolutely anybody, and every time I give somebody the benefit of the doubt, um, they, they prove to me they're not sincere. How do I deal with this? Okay, again, our pickers are broken. Our pickers are broken until we handle this original wound. So we are going to continually go for who reminds us, who reminds us of the most difficult parent that we had to deal with. It's our inner child, so we gotta get the inner child grown up. We've gotta get this original wound from our family of origin, mom, dad, grandparents, whoever, handled. And we've got to be the ones in charge. The adult us has to be the ones in charge, not the kid. So it's, it's a matter of fixing your picker. Gotta fix the picker. You gotta fix the original wound. There's no way around it. Everybody's always like, I don't wanna deal with the original wound. Well, guess what? You deal with the original wound, you get this bad boy handled, your picker gets fixed, you stop picking people that remind you of mom, dad, grandparents, whoever. So that's what you want to do. Uh, okay, how can someone forgive somebody who unintentionally triggered you? It's a choice. It's a choice. It's an accident. If somebody unintentionally triggered you, and it was not on purpose, and they just, you know, accidentally 
triggered you, then you recognize it's an accident. It's, it's no different than a child who makes a mistake. Do you sit there and beat the living crap out of the kid because they spilled milk? No, you don't. You point it out. You know, what'd you learn from it? Don't do that again. Thank you very much. Scoot the milk further back on the counter. You know, but you don't sit there and just bludgeon them and hold a resentment towards the kid because they made a mistake. So it's a choice. You educate, you educate, you educate them. Hey, you know what? That was a trigger. Got to let you know I got really, really triggered when that happened. Please don't do that again. I really appreciate that. And then you forgive them for not knowing better. And you forgive yourself. So when we are raised by narcissists, they're vindictive motherfuckers. Let me tell you that right the fuck now, okay? They don't forgive. And they don't teach us to forgive. They teach us an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Very, very Italianic thinking. Borderline personality disorder, when it gets malignant, also has very, very Italianic thinking. So the Italianic thinking is, you know, splitting. You know, it's you hurt me, I'll hurt you. I'll, you know, it's, it's you did this on purpose, I'm going to make you pay. An eye for an eye makes the entire world blind, okay? So what you want to do is if it was unintentional, it was not on purpose, you do not hold that against them. You educate hey, that was really triggering, please don't do that again. And then if they do it again, now that's on purpose. And that's when you go, mm -hmm, we are so done. Be done. Does that make sense? So yeah, so that's how you handle that. Okay, uh, what's a good way to get rid of guilt when feeling angry towards abusive parents? Okay, here's the deal. Guilt is used by the abusers to keep us from feeling authentic emotions. Fear, obligation, and guilt is what they wield. So when we get justifiably angry at an abusive parent, guess what they throw into our face? I'm your father. I'm your mother. You can't, you can't be mad at me. I'll give you something to be mad about. You know, all of that bullshit. Or they throw the Bible up in people's face. You know, honor thy mother and father. Well, the very next line says, parents, do not bring your children to anger. Hmm. Oh, go figure. It's a two-way street. Go to clunk. So the point being is, it's okay for you to be angry at your abusive parent. It is okay. So when the guilt pops up, you acknowledge it. Hello, guilt. Yes, I see you. And I have an absolute right to be angry at the parent who abused me. So thank you for your input. Kindly shut the fuck up. Why? Because I say so. How about you go play in traffic? Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye right when you get work. Bye-bye. I have a right to be angry. And then you allow yourself to be angry and you keep telling the guilt to fuck off. So here's the deal. If you took your anger and you actually harmed somebody, yeah, that's not good. But if you're just expressing it and writing it out and getting it out of your head, getting it onto paper, trotting it out to the barbecue and burning it, yeah, that's your right. That's your right. And you have a right to feel angry towards an abusive parent. I was hugely, and I still am sometimes, hugely angry about my dad. He was abusive. He was mean. He was vicious. He harmed all of my sisters and my brother, you know, I mean, he was not a nice guy. He wasn't. And so, yeah, are, do we have a right to be angry at him? You damn straight we do. And does it pop up every once in a while, even though I've been working on it for years? Yeah, every once in a while it does, especially when I hear the lasting effects that has affected my sisters or my brother or, you know, whatever. It's like, oh, motherfucker has been dead for 20 plus years and you're still fucking things up. So do you see where I'm going with that? You have a right to be pissed and it's okay. It's okay. It's what you do with the anger that makes it helpful or hurtful. So the guilt is used by the abuser to keep us from expressing genuine, authentic anger at their behaviors. They don't want to be called out on it, so they use the guilt trips on us. So you got to let that shit go, okay? All right. Um, any tips for dealing with triggers from financial abuse? My big thing is feeling used when I'm the only friend with a car and have to pick up everyone and drop them off. You get to say no. We're going to talk about that next week. So um, we are instilled with codependency. Our abusers make us responsible for everybody and their dog. And we feel obligated, fear, obligation, and guilt to take care of everyone. That is not your job. Let it the fuck go. No is your friend. And I'm going to be talking more about that next week. 
So in, in confrontation, this would be a confrontation. I'm sorry, I cannot take you. I am not using, either you start paying me gas mileage, gas money, mileage, whatever, but no, it's not my job. It's not my job. It's not your job. You're not an Uber. You're not a Lyft. You're not a taxi. It's not your job. So if they guilt you, any relationship that makes you feel fearful, obligated, or guilty is an unhealthy relationship. That is a huge red flag. So if you're feeling obligated to do this, just because you happen to have a car and nobody else does, uh-uh, you get to say no. No is your friend. And I know it feels weird. I know it does. I know it does. Because we're trained not ever to say no. And if we did say no, we got punished or we got cold shouldered. We got, you know, the whole, mm, I'm not going to talk to you, you know, because they're pissed because we're not doing what they want. And that is a fear. And again, that goes back to inner child. So that stuff needs to get handled so that you're able to say no. And I mean it, you know, here's, here's the boundary. Here's what, you know, I can put up with and here's what I won't. You know, so that you don't feel taken advantage of. So a good book for that is Codependent No More and Beyond Codependent No More, both by Melanie Beattie. There's also books by PM Melody that are really good. And there is uh, The Diseased Please by Harriet Breaker. Know is your friend. Use it well. Use it wisely. Use it often. All right. Hope that answered that question. All right. Done with that one. Um, is it normal to constantly struggle with guilt about even feeling some family members are abusive. I also go just back and forth doubting what I feel about them. Trust your gut. Trust your gut. Your gut will never lie to you. Your head and your heart will tell stories. If you start hearing yes, but blah, 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 no, but blah, 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 huge story. That's your head or your heart talking. That is not your gut. Trust your gut. And any relationship, I'm going to say it again, that engenders fear, obligation, or guilt when you are expressing your genuine feelings about somebody or some situation, that's a red flag that that relationship is not healthy. So again, guilt is used by abusers to keep us from feeling and from expressing. So trust your gut. Trust your gut. What does your gut tell you about these people? Listen to that. Okay. Um, Oh, God. Is Myers-Briggs personality identification valid and helpful in self-assessment so you can heal and cope? No. I'm sorry. Myers-Briggs is not scientific. It was developed by two housewives in Minnesota. Um, so the answer to that is resounding no. Is it fun to look at and kind of get an idea about your personality? Well, yeah, it's kind of like a horoscope. So um, I don't like it. I don't know why companies use it. They shouldn't. It is not uh, peer-reviewed. It is not scientific in any way, shape, or form. Um, so, yes, I have very strong opinions on that. So it's, it's fun like a horoscope is fun, but that's it. So there that is. Um, okay. Uh, all right. How do you navigate raising kids who are abusive you can't cut out a kid when they have nowhere to go. Okay, here's the deal. I don't care who they are. I don't care if it's your kid. I don't care if it's your spouse. I don't care if it's your family member. If they are abusive, you let them know, this is not going to fly. I'm not going to put up with this. Here are your options. You can go to counseling. You can do this. You can do that. If they say no to all of it, then you cut them the fuck off and let them suffer the natural consequences of their bad behavior just like with any addict. So you don't put up with abuse no matter who it's from, period. Okay. Um, do, do, do. What type of therapist would be happy to really work on assertiveness and boundaries, any specific orientation? Reality therapy is really good. Uh, DBT is really good. CBT is really good. Really, it's the therapist that needs to be really good. So a good therapist, w when you talk to them and say, hey, I'm getting mowed over by my family and friends, I don't really have good boundaries. They're going to start working with you on boundaries. They're going to start working with you on assertiveness and how to say no and how to stand up for yourself and how the buck stops here and here's the boundary. So uh, the therapist needs to be good. It's really, it doesn't matter what the modality is. The therapist needs to be good. So look for somebody who's got good reviews. Look for somebody who um, you know somebody else maybe that has gone to them, that type of thing, and has gotten stronger in their boundaries and self-esteem. That's what you want. Okay, how much time do we have? Oh, damn it. 
Okay, well, I finished with that. Do I have enough time? Maybe I'll go for a few minutes. Okay, um, I have gone no contact with my ex-borderline personality disorder person. Every so often, she does indirect things to keep a connection. Will it continue or get more desperate, obvious, direct, or start to fade? What has been your experience? It depends on the person. It depends on the person. So generally, abusers in general would rather have a fucked up, dysfunctional connection to somebody than no connection at all because they need the drama. They need the supply. So the best thing to do is if you have gone no contact, stay no contact. Don't rise to the bait. Don't respond. Don't go for the hoovers. Don't nothing. Even if it's indirect, you just Nope. And sometimes they go away. Sometimes when they realize that they're not getting their supply filled, they'll stop. Other times they get more and more desperate and they become crazy stalkers. And at that point you file an order of protection and you call the police each and every time they violate it. Okay. I am out of time. So, uh, all right. I will talk to you guys on Sunday about boundaries and assertiveness and saying no, how to confront, how to do that, how to, how to overcome the guilt. All right, guys, have a great week and I will talk to you then. Bye.